sign with me the pledge of the American flag. Salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Pledge to the Christian flag. I pledge
again, it sure is good to see all of you this morning. Do we have any first time visitors with us? Any first time visitors? All right. Well, y'all know how it works. <laughs> Sit back and enjoy all that God has in store for you. Amen. I'm sure our pastor has a wonderful service for us this morning. I'm looking forward to it. Let's open our service. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, thank you so much for all you bless us with, all you provide for us. You are so wonderful, and we praise you. Lord, we thank you for all those who have given up their time, their lives for this nation. Lord, please continue to bless us. Guide this nation. Help us to stay strong and help us to continue serving the Lord that this nation was founded on. You are so wonderful. Lord, we praise you. And we pray for all those from our leadership. Lord, they truly need you this morning. Guide them, bless them, grant them wisdom. Lord, let them make the right decisions, the best decisions for the people of this nation. But we pray for our military, our law enforcement, our firefighters, EMTs, Lord, all those that stand in harm's way for us. Lord, bless them, protect them. Lord, we pray for all of our schools, our teachers, our faculty and staff, bless our children. Keep them safe on their way to and from school and while they're there, Lord, if they need you. Bless them. Lord, we pray for all of our local churches, all those that serve the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. Bless the services, be with all the pastors, Sunday school teachers, all of those that are serving you today. Guide us. Help us to stand firmly on your word, on your truth, and to continue to teach and preach exactly that, Lord. We pray especially for the Desert Baptist Church this morning. Yes. Lord, Please continue to help us financially. Please help us to continue to grow and reach those that need to hear about you. Give us the strength and courage to step out to those who are around us and be willing to be used by our Savior to tell those about Jesus Christ. Yes. Lord, be with our pastor this morning. Give him strength. Give him courage, Lord. Help him to know exactly what you want him to say. Give him all that he needs to spread your love to this congregation today. Speak through him and touch our hearts. Lord, we pray for all those who are prayerless this morning, all those that need your help and your strength, whether it's financially, physically, Lord, whatever the case might be, Lord, touch them. Bless each life according to your will. And Lord, this morning, we ask that you will be done in each service. Take control. Use our pastor, use our choir, all those that are serving this morning to touch the hearts of those in the congregation. Again, bless us and continue to use us as we leave here today. All these things we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 <laughs> Let's all turn our hymn to 634, hymn number 634. This is our offertory hymn. We're going to sing all four verses and let's all stand. Let's sing.
opportunity and blessing to come in, come into your place of worship to do it, Father. Because, Father, it was a God's sacrifice. Yeah. And, Father, we have so many that's here today, so many here that, that have loved ones that never come back, Father. For that very reason, Father, protect our freedom, Father. Jesus, Master, you said in John 15, 13, there's no greater love than a man who lays down his life for a friend. Amen. Father, that's what I think of out of that scripture, Father, when you mentioned that. I think of all the servicemen and women who's ever served. They take an oath that if they need to lay down their life for this country, they will. And Father, I just ask you just to bless each one of them, Father. Bless the ones who have served. Bless the ones serving. And bless the families, Father, to sacrifice their loved ones being away so much for them having to move all around the world, Father. Father, we just, as Brother David said, Father, we just couldn't live in a, in a better country, Father. And we are so blessed to live in this great nation. So, Father, I just ask you, Father, just to use us right here at Bethesda, starting right now, Father, to take your love out to this world, to change it. He used 12 men to change the world. Father, he could use us, a lot more than 12 of us here, to start right here in our community, to start changing our country and the world. Father, we just love you. We thank you for these blessings. We ask you to bless these tithes and offerings, Father. Just, just pray, Father, they bless your heart, Father. And Father, you just continue to use them, to use us, Father, to bless you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people say Amen. Amen.
Hey, how y'all doing? Hey, man. Hey, y'all don't know me. My name's Gail Connor. Hey, Gail. Hi. Uh, we used to be members here and we left for four years. Three is the normal time. Five, three, seven. Yeah, we have an extra year just in case. Uh, some of you knew I played saxophone. I picked it up after a 35 year hiatus. Uh, I didn't even know I could play the saxophone. When I played it here the first time about six years ago, five years ago. But anyhow, the song I'm going to play for y'all today is called Amazing Grace. It's probably the best known hymn in the world. But it was written by an Englishman, John Newton, who uh, lived from 1725 to 1807. And he started. Uh, going on a ship when he was 11 years old, and uh, he was actually a professed atheist uh, and a slave trader in his young life, but uh, uh, he uh, joined the Navy when he was 20 and didn't like it, so he left, but they, they caught him and put him on some slave ships, so he was, uh, I guess, a crew member for a number of years, then he started being a captain on the slave ships who were stealing slaves from Africa bring him over to Charleston, South Carolina. Well, he didn't like the slave trade, so uh, one of his uh, march, he was about 24 years old, had a storm, and the storm was so bad that he ran up to grab the wheel of the ship and said that, prayed to the Lord that if uh, he would give him grace and let him through the storm, he would change his life around. Well, he did a few years later. He didn't do it right away, but anyhow, he, uh, he coined some words, amazing grace, probably. Uh, some of the words he might have gotten from the slaves in the ship, they don't know for sure. But um, his conversion happened during that storm. And like they say, that they don't have any atheists in, a, in foxholes. So, uh, anyhow, he coined the words, amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. I was, was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. We got about four pages of this, I'm not going to go through all of it, but anyhow. Um, in 2005, um, they had a movie called Amazing Grace, and the producer of that show asked uh, this fellow in uh, Texas if he could uh, add something to the, to the music. So he went to Chris Tomlin, Tomlin who, uh, who added a, a little bit to the verse of uh, Amazing Grace by adding the words, my chains are gone. He kept the first, second, fourth, and sixth stanzas of the song, but added, uh, amazing grace, my chains are gone. Let's see how they go. That's so much here, I can't read what I'm writing here. But anyhow, uh, he said the, uh, the song, famous song, he didn't, originally didn't think he could add anything to it, such a great song, but then he uh, remembered that the verse of 10,000 years was added 100 years after the original song, so he said, well, I guess I can add a couple, a little bit to it. So he said, my chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, his mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. So I'll try to do justice to it a little bit. Thank uh you. -huh. 
everybody is uh, in honor of our veterans. So uh, actually, if you all set it up right now, that'd be wonderful. No way to not. <laughs>
1972 to 1982, I was 10 years in National Guard, Army National Guard in Florida, North Carolina, and Georgia.
Um, two of them are from the Trudeau family. Uh, in, the, in the passing of Miss Mary Ann, Miss Donna, we are still praying for you, daughter, lifting you up. And they're both thank you cards. One for the beautiful peace lily. Uh, thank you for your thoughts and prayers. And that's from uh, uh, Miss Mary Ann's family. And then many thanks for all the concerns and prayers uh, for Mary Ann Trudeau. We greatly appreciate her. the sandwich trays and chips and uh, given to us in our time of need. Again, that says thank you. And daughter, we appreciate you. And we're still praying for you and your family, lifting you up in the loss of your mom. Amen. Uh, and on a uh, secondary note here, uh, it says, uh, they would, uh, this is from Sherry and Clayton, said that they would like to, to give the church a big thank you for allowing them to use the facilities, uh, as well as for everyone who brought food uh, to the, re the reveal party, said we're excited uh, to be having a little girl uh, and happy to be raising her with such a loving church. So uh, uh, thank you from them too. Thank you, church. Okay, now I can actually say it's a little girl. I can officially say that's a little girl. Uh, if you've got your Bibles, open them with me, please. Uh, I, I really don't have time to preach this message, uh, to be quite honest with you. Uh, there's, and I hate to do it a, an injustice, so what I might do is just kind of do half of it uh, today, and I may do the other half tonight. Uh, so you, when you come back tonight, you might be, you're not hearing a rerun, you may just hear the last half of this message, okay? Uh, so, uh, if you've got your Bible, open with me, please, to the 16th chapter of uh, John, uh, we're going to be using verses 5 uh, through 15, and we're, again, remember, we're talking about building a thankful life. Veterans Day couldn't come on a better day. And I'll tell you why. Uh, because in this series of being thankful, we need to be thankful for all of those that have sacrificed and all of those who have served us and made it possible for us to be here today. So, if you are not thankful, maybe the after the day, maybe this other pillar that we're talking about will help you have that thankful heart and that thankful spirit. Uh, you know, today, it's funny, uh, we've been dealing with this uh, subject for the last two Sundays, and I want to kind of go back to our, our, our I guess, our base scripture uh, in the book of Philippians. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6, it says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Now, every time we come to this verse, I tell you, that God is not the, the prayer answering vending machine in heaven. Okay? He's not some old man uh, uh, with a long beard sitting on the front porch of heaven waiting to just give you whatever you desire. But he is our heavenly father who cares about everything that happens to us. He wants to hear about everything in your life that applies. He wants to know everything that you're facing. The good times and the bad times. And, and here's the deal. The, the whole premise of this verse is that we have to have the right attitude when we approach Him. Now, there are a lot of people who come to God and they say, Hey, I want this, I want that. Hey, make this happen. I need a pink Cadillac and all those other kind of things. I need to win the lotto and all that. But they're not focused on God. And they're not coming with a thankful heart. And the idea is, is that we have to be thankful today when we approach God. Thankful, first and foremost, we found out that He is God. Is that not right? And that Jesus Christ is our Savior. And then today, what I'd like to look at is thankful that He has sent the Comforter on our behalf. Now, think about this for just a minute. We're fixing to talk about a subject that most Baptists get very uncomfortable about. And that is... The Holy Spirit. Shock. Now I know when I say Holy Spirit, most of y'all think about pew running and, and snake handling and all that kind of stuff. I can't believe it, preacher. You're smack dab in the middle of a Southern Baptist church and no self-respecting Baptist is going to talk about the Holy Spirit. Well, the thing about it is the, the idea of the Holy Spirit has been so maligned, so mistaught, so misunderstood about who He is that most of us are so afraid that when we think about it, we think, oh my goodness, it's Casper, the friendly ghost. <laughs> well, you know, in reality, that's not who he is. <laughs> and it's not a it, it's a who. Amen. And that who is the Spirit of God. Amen. And let me tell you something, folks. Without him, we would not be here. Amen. 
Without him, you would not be here. Because the Bible tells us that he is the very one that seals us when we come in to the fellowship of God. He is the one, he is the conduit through which God sends us his righteousness, sends us his love, sends us his grace, and he comes to abide in each and every believer at the time of conversion and stays with you. Now, I'm going to tell you something. We've got a group of folks who say, gee, you know what? We need a, a Holy Ghost revival. We need the Holy Ghost this. We need more of the Holy Ghost. You need to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Well, let me tell you something. The Bible tells us that when you get saved, you get all the Holy Spirit you need. Now, let me tell you something. John said, I must decrease so that he might increase. You don't need more of the Holy Spirit in your life. You need less of you. I like the way uh, uh, D.L. Moody put it. He said, you know, how can I get all of the air out of this glass? He had a glass uh, on the podium with him. And somebody said, well, you know, you can put a vacuum pump on it and pump all the air out of it. He said, no, that wouldn't work. He said, that would crush the glass. He said, you know, how can I get all of the air out of this? And, and, and after several suggestions, he took a pitcher of water and he poured the water into the glass. And guess what happened? All the air was forced out. And he said, you know, the Holy Spirit is the exact same way. When we pour, pour ourselves out and allow Him to fill us up, we have everything we need to do everything that God would have us to do here on this planet. And I don't know about you folks, but I need it. I need it every day because you can't function. You can't do what God would have you to do in your own flesh. It would crush you without his presence. But I get ahead of myself a little bit. This is an interesting subject to me, and it's a subject that is most, most in need of being preached to the church today. Look with me in verse 5 of chapter 16 of the book of John. Okay, with me? He says this. He says, But now I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you ask me whether thou goest thou. But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Now, it's interesting when you go back to verse 5, that Jesus goes back to a subject that none of us like to talk about. And that is the subject of the departure of this life. That's because most of us have got in mind that this is home. We like our lazy boys. We like our chair. We like the people we know. Some of us even like our next door neighbor. Say amen. Some of us not so much. But anyway, the idea is, is that guess what? We think this is our home. And so when we talk about leaving this earthly planet, guess what people do? They get nervous. They change the subject. I remember as a, as a young boy uh, riding back with my mom and dad from uh, Alabama. And on the way back, they were talking about their will. You know, uh, you guys in the military, you know, you can never go outside the States, I guess, or maybe when you join the They make you have a will. You have no choice, you know what I'm saying? And folks, let me tell you something. You need to have a will, okay? But, but they make you have a will. But to a young boy listening to his mom and dad talk about their mortality, that was a subject that I just didn't want to hear. I didn't want to think about the idea of my mom and dad not being here. You know why? Because I love my mom and dad. And there's great comfort in talking and being with them. But what they understood was, guess what? You brought nothing in the world, guess what's going to happen when you leave? You don't take nothing out with you. But as sure as it is, it is appointed on a man who wants to die, and after that, the judgment. And they knew this. And see, I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't want to think about it. And even today, when I think about uh, my parents' mortality, it still bothers me to a point. But I know this, that guess what? They ain't none of us short of the rapture getting out of this place alive. Say amen. amen. And you know what? When Jesus told him, you remember back in John chapter 14? He said, I go to prepare a place for you. 
Remember that's a, that favorite funeral sermon everybody likes to hear? I go to prepare a place for you. He said, if I go, I'm going to come back and do what? Receive you unto myself. Is that not right? But see, they don't want to talk about that. They had it pretty good. You know, uh, uh, now that they had to have some money because, you know, Judas had the purse that had, had the silver in it, the gold. Uh, now that they had to have a little money and Jesus was comfortable to be around and it was pretty neat to be a part of the star, uh, you know, I, I guess the, uh, uh, the remedies <laughs> that go along with Jesus when he was healing folks and doing all those miracles. That had to be pretty neat, don't you think? Yeah. And then he says, oh, by the way, I'm fixing to leave. And he said, you know what? When I said that, you didn't even bother to ask me what? You didn't ask me where I'm going. You know why they didn't ask? Because they didn't want to talk about it. Because they didn't want to hear about it. That's why they didn't talk. And today, guess what? When we begin to talk to people about leaving this planet, guess what people do? Not me, brother. Must be somebody else you're talking about. Well, here's the deal. Think about it for a minute. Jesus said that not only was it necessary for him to leave, but he said what? It was expedient. Do you know what that means? That means that it was in their best interest that he leave. Now think about that for just a minute, because here's the deal. How, what could be better than to walk with Jesus? How many people do you know who have said, if I could just see Jesus face to face? Man, I'm going to tell you what, I believe. Boy, if I could just see one of them miracles, I believe. And then Jesus says, guess what? He tells us how, you're better off with me not being here. Yeah. Now, what's wrong with that picture? Because <coughs> I don't know about y'all, but if I'd have been with them, I'd have been real happy that he was here. Yeah. I'd have been real happy. You know, people say, what would you do if Jesus walked down the aisle? Well, I'll tell you what, if a believer walked down the aisle, guess what happened? Jesus was inside of them in the form of the Holy Spirit. Is that not right? And it did walk down the aisle. I hear people tell me all the time, you need to go to the Holy Land. You need to go to uh, the supposed tomb, the garden tomb, and you need to go to, the, uh, 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 to the, the church of the Holy Sepulchre. You need to go to all those places. Because that's holy ground. Well, you know what? The Bible tells me that everywhere I put my feet is holy ground. Yeah. Not because I'm holy, but because the one who has sealed me, the one who lives inside of me, is holy. Amen? And guess what? I don't have to make a trip to some uh, uh, special site, because guess what? The special site is inside of me. And it is because the Lord lives inside. But listen to this. He says, you know what? He said, verse 6, he says, but because I have said these things unto you, sorrow has filled your heart. Now think about that for just a minute. He said, I told you these things, and what happened? They had a typical Baptist response, which was what? Lip poked out, mad, wine. Because, hey, the meal ticket's fixing to leave. Hey, you know what? We're going to have to get out of our comfort zone. God ever done that to you before? Got you in a place where you had to get out of your comfort zone. Where, you know, you were comfortable right where you're at. Lord, I can't believe you're going to move me from here. And God says, what? I don't need you in this spot. I need you over here. And most of the time, what do we say? Not so, Lord. Well, have you thought about that statement for just a minute? Not so, Lord. If he's your Lord, what can't you do? Tell him no. Say amen. Yeah. So the idea is, they said, look, we don't want you to go. We're sorrowful that you're going to go. But he says this. He says, I must leave. Why? What, what was the reason? Because that if I don't go, who's not coming? Now, if you have an NIV Bible, anybody here got an NIV Bible? No. Nobody is. It says what, Miss Susan? What is it called? It is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come. The who? The counselor. The counselor. Okay. Anybody else got another version? One version, and I, I can't remember whether it's American Standard, says advocate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right? 
The comforter, the advocate, the counselor, the comforter, the one who comes along. But actually the Greek word there is called paraclete. And it means to come alongside. In other words, the one that's going to come alongside of you and walk with you and make it possible for you to do everything that I've commanded you to do, he says, he's not coming unless I go. Now, I explained something to you uh, when we were talking about God. I said God was omniscient and he was omnipresent. Anybody know what that means? That means he was everywhere at once. When Jesus took off the robes of heaven and put on the robes of flesh and was born into a, 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 a was born in a stable, guess what he did? He gave up the power of omnipresence to do what? To take on a fleshly body that he might live a perfect life and die for us. Okay? When he did that, guess what? He couldn't be everywhere at once. The physical limitation of the flesh permitted that. Okay? That's why he said he took on the form of a servant. Alright? So, he says, the comforter is going to come, and what will the comforter do? He will be everywhere at once. He can be inside of every believer at one time. Why? Because he is the third person of the Godhead. Does that make any sense? Okay. You need to understand that because here's the deal. Jesus said, it's better that I go away and that he come. Now, I don't know about y'all, buddy. I'll tell you, that would have blown me out of the water. I would have said to myself, hey, you know what? I'd rather Jesus be here. Jesus said that you're better off to have the Holy Spirit with you because the Holy Spirit is going to teach you all things. It's going to guide you in all things. Amen. Now, Acts 1 Amen. tells us about the coming of the Holy Spirit. And most of us can say, you know, I know that the coming of the Holy Spirit is like a mighty rushing wind. Okay? And I know that the coming of the Holy Spirit was like, uh, uh, not only a mighty rush, but the tongues of cloven fire came and set upon each believer. And, and what they're saying is, you know what? When, when the Holy Spirit came in that upper room, He presented and manifested Himself. And most of us say, I remember Pentecost, man. I will tell you, them people spoke in tongues. <laughs> well, you know what they missed? They missed the real miracle which was that every person heard the gospel of Jesus Christ in their own language. Because you see, the Bible says, Paul said, God chose the foolishness of preaching to save men's souls. In other words, they had not heard the words of life until, until each one of them heard it in their own language. And the real miracle is not that they spoke in a language that they can understand, but that each and every one of them heard it, and those that heard it received the Holy, received the Holy Spirit and received God as their Savior. That's the true miracle of Pentecost. So, we need to be thankful. Thankful for the Lord. We need to be thankful for the Holy Spirit because it builds in us that thankful spirit. His presence is necessary for you to do whatever it is that God has sent you to do. Now the question is this. Have you ever received the Holy Spirit? Now how do you do that, preacher? Well, you hear the gospel. The Holy Spirit says, guess what? You need a Savior. He's the one that convicts the world of sin. And we don't have time to get into that this morning, but we will tonight. He is the one that convicts the world of sin. And he is the one that tells you, guess what? You're a sinner. And you need salvation. And that salvation only comes through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter how good you are. It doesn't matter all the things you've done for the church. It only matters whether or not you have trusted in the shed blood of Jesus finished work of Calvary. So this morning, the question is this. Have you received Him as Lord and Savior? Have you allowed the Holy Spirit to come into your life and seal you? Have you said, Jesus, I need a Savior and you're it. Maybe today you'd say, preacher, you know what? I've been in church a lot of times. 
I, I, and, you know, and I've held on to that pew. And you know, I was just waiting for that last amen so I could get out. Maybe that's where you're at today. Maybe today you need to come and receive Him as the Lord and Savior. But just as important as that, if you say, Preacher, you know what? Maybe you were saved. Maybe you were saved right here in this church. Maybe you say, Preacher, you know what? But my life doesn't reflect that I walk in the light. Because you see, a lot of folks try and walk in their own strength. A lot of folks try to come around and say, hey, you know what? I'm going to do this because I want to do this. Well, you know what? The Bible says you can't walk the Christian life in your own strength, but that you need the Holy Spirit to help you, to guide you, to give you instruction. Maybe today you say, preacher, you know what? I haven't been listening. He's been speaking to my heart. I'm God's child, but I've not been listening. Maybe today you need to receive him as Lord and Savior. Maybe today you need to follow his leadership if you're his child. Or maybe today, you know what? You might say, preacher, I've been saved, but I've never been baptized. Maybe today you need to follow him in believer's baptism. I don't know. I don't know whatever your need might be, but I'll tell you what, I can think of no better day to get saved than on Veterans Day in 2017. I can think of no better place to get saved than right here at Bethesda Baptist Church, right smack dab in the middle of Brazilian Georgia. I can think of no better time to rededicate your life than right here. I can think of no better place. And the Bible says today is the day. Maybe today you need a fresh start. Maybe today you need a place of service. I don't know. Whatever you need might be. He's here. He's here in the presence of his Holy Spirit. And he wants to lead you. He wants to comfort you and guide you if you'll just be given a chance. Brother Dave, what number are we going to sing today? Page 312. Page 312. Would you take your hymnal?